Okay, I think we're going to get started. Um, welcome to Truth and Storytelling at the Right Around the Murray Festival. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Wiradjuri elders and uh, pay my respects to elders past, present and future. So I am Eliza Henry Jones and I am joined today by Dr. Lee Kaufman and Patty Miller, who I'm very, very excited to be in conversation with. Uh, Dr. Lee Kaufman is a Russian-born Israeli-Australian author of three fiction books and two memoirs, including Imperfect, which was shortlisted for the Nib Literary Award and The Dangerous Bride. Co-editor of Rebellious Daughters and editor of Split, which was longlisted for the ABIA Awards. Anthologies of memoirs by prominent Australian authors. Or Split. Her, work, her short works have been widely published in Australia, the US, the UK, Scotland, Israel and Canada. Her blog was a finalist for Best Australian Blogs in 2014, and Lee's most recent work is The Rider Late Bear, which we'll be talking about today. And Patty Miller is the author of 10 books, including Australia's best-selling life writing text, Writing Your Life, the memoir book, and Writing True Stories, as well as the novel Child and five memoir narrative nonfiction books, The Last One Who Remembers, Whatever the Gods Do, The Critically Acclaimed The Mind of the Thief, long and short listed for a number of prizes and winner of the 2013 New South Premier's Prize for History, Ransacking Paris, The Joy of High Places, and her latest True Friends. So Patty writes personal essays and articles and is published regularly in national newspapers, magazines, and literary and art journals. She's been teaching life writing around Australia since 1991 and gives writing courses in Paris and London each year. What a life. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so there will be time for questions at the end of the session, so you can start thinking up some really, really good ones. And I thought we'd start by having Lee and Patty give a bit of an overview of their work for those that haven't yet had the pleasure of reading their latest work. So Lee, can you tell us about The Rider Laid Bear? Yeah, sure, thank you. Um, so the Rider Laid Bear is a kind of, I don't even know how to define it, it's sort of a cross between <laughs> memoir and um, book of essays about writing. But, and when I was writing it, when my publisher asked me to write this book, he just said to me, write something about writing because I've been blogging about this for many years now. Uh, and I've been teaching writing for many years as well, not as many as Patty, who is really the, <laughs> <laughs> the experienced teacher here, but still, I've done it for over 15 years now. So when my publisher said to be solely write something about writing, I kind of thought, oh, great, I've got the blog, and I'll just like, pull the posts, and I'll have this book, and for, for, five, for five minutes, I was very happy, and then I... <laughs> And then it dawned on me that my blog was nothing like a sort of a coherent entity. There were musings about what it's like, what writer's life, and, and, and some thoughts on the process, but nothing sort of unifying. And then I thought about um, how in my early 30s I, was, I had this experience of um, writer's blog. And I know that some writers don't believe in writer's blog, but I just think they never had it. <laughs> So, so it's kind of akin a bit when neuroscience shows it now too, but the symptoms are pretty much akin to symptoms of anxiety and depression when you can really sort of ter terrified of writing. And it occurred to me that at that time, um, my main issue probably was with emotional honesty. And I'm thinking about emotional honesty in three different ways. So emotional honesty, how honest you are on the page as a writer, but then also emotional honesty in um, creative process. How much are you honest with yourself and self-reflective about what you actually need as a writer? And then also honesty about how, what kind of life choices do you make? How do you fit your writing into your personal life or vice versa? And I thought that if I had some kind of book at the time when I was going through those four years of really struggling to write, writing a lot, but writing badly, um, I was thinking, if I had somebody sort of tell me at that time that it's okay if to struggle with, this, uh, with emotional honesty, it's okay to sort of be uh, in trouble with your writing, it's just all part of the process, I probably would have got maybe unblocked a bit earlier because I, I just thought if I can't write easily, if I can't sort of be complex as I want to be on the page, I'm, that's it, it will never happen again, I will never write a book. So, I ended up writing um, this book called Writer Laid Bear, which is really looking at um, the life and work of writers through the lens of emotional honesty. Mm -hmm. mm. 
Thank you very much, Lee. Patty, can you please tell us about True Friends? Okay, um, well, as the, the title suggests, um, it looks at um, friendship, um, in particular um, friendship uh, between uh, women. It's, it's a memoir um, narrative non-fiction um, and uh, there's a central storyline about um, friendship breakup. Um, and I think uh, that, that was because um, I, I realised that uh, people didn't talk about or write about, uh, there's no, fi I couldn't think of films about or poems or songs about friendship breakups. There's all about romance and marriages breaking up but not about friendships breaking up. And lots of people were saying to me that it, it hurts just as much, you know, and it's just as bewildering. So, um, but, but really it wasn't that kind of um, altruistic kind of reason to write. It was because I had been through it mm. and was feeling very bewildered. So that story, The, the True Friends, is about a, a friendship breakup, but... I also wanted to explore other friendships, so there's uh, uh, weaves in and out with friendships other than my life, um, other than that central one. And also, um, I wanted to write um, about how we know other people, you know, through memory. So there's a lot of uh, material about memory and how we know other people and how we stitch together in our minds our picture mm -hmm. of other people and also threaded through, it's going to sound very complicated now, but it's <laughs> threaded through it is um, uh, the story of the, the very first story ever found, um, which is the, uh, well, not, well, the first written story ever found is um, the Epic of Gilgamesh. And surprisingly and very interestingly to me, it's actually about a friendship, mm -hmm. the first story that people kind of chipped into the clay, um, or pressed into the clay, rather. So it's kind of weaving those different elements together, um, hopefully into um, something which um, uh, kind of illuminates um, what it is to be friends with somebody, I guess. Mm. Yeah, it was absolutely illuminating. And just out of interest, um, anyone that's gone through a r friendship breakup, can you raise your hands? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it <laughs> happens. Right. It does, it really, really does. <laughs> it does happen, yeah. Um, thank you for running us through True Friends. And I think my first question is just going to start us off with a bit of a bang, but what is truth in storytelling? How, how do you sort of think about it when you sit down to write? Do you want to go first? <laughs> me? me? Okay. okay. Well, I think it, to me it, it can only be... Um, uh, my own truth, mm. my own uh, construction. I mean, I, I think our whole self and our whole kind of experience of reality is a construction. I mean, that's my kind of starting point anyway. And it's, it's something that we put together from everything that we observe every day through our senses and we put it together into uh, something that we call reality. So for me as a writer, it's getting that... Um, reality onto the page. It's in a sense not that much to do with a kind of factual mm. um, reality, if there is such a thing. It's 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 my um, construction of what I experience in the world, you know. And 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 I think that that creates lots of problems because people will often read something as a kind of factual representation of reality, when really it's only the kind of uh, uh, lacy, holy, um, full of holes thing mm -hmm. um, inside my head that I'm trying to get on the page. And I think it's the same for fiction and non-fiction. It's it, that that truth is is simply your own um, awareness, your own construction mm -hmm. of what it's like to be in the world, really. Mm. Mm. And um, you delve into that so beautifully in True Friends. You know, you sort of interrogate yourself as you go along. You know, I. I I visualise this person wearing a light shirt, but surely it would have been winter, so that can't be right. Or you interrogate the conversations you've had or facts that you've sort of held in your mind that you've then kind of had to reevaluate as you kind of sunk deeper into the story. So it's such a fascinating approach. 
to the topic of friendship. Well, the, and the things that you think about other people and the things you remember, they can be proved not to be true. Mm. You know, that, I mean, that's what happened to me when I was, when I was writing the book. And they, that person didn't even know I was writing the book. Mm. And she sent me some photographs and letters that I had, um, that were taken and written three years after I thought our friendship mm. had ended. So um, my, my version of reality can be proved sometimes <laughs> not to be right, but I, that, that's not the point to me. It's, mm. it's not, I, I'm not a historian, you know, um, and I'm not working in the, in the law courts. Um, so it doesn't have to, it, and, and, it's, and it's not that I'm making things up, it's that this is my version of things. Mm. Yeah, yeah honouring your own truth. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Thank you, Patty. <laughs> Lee. Thank you. Um, I really like how you sort of view in your book, Intro Friends, uh, Patty, this whole idea of yeah, memory and truth, because memoir is indeed, I mean, it comes from the word memory, and, and mm. sort of, yeah. Um, so I'm, a lot of what you said really resonates with me. And what I would add to this conversation is that when I write what I really want to convey, when I write true stories um, or autobiographical fiction, which I sometimes do, what's most important for me to convey is the emotional truth of the experience. And paradoxically, often to convey emotional truth of the experience, I have to play with the factual truth. Mm. <laughs> and I'll give you an example of what I mean by this. So when I was writing my first memoir and my first book in English. That was when I was coming out of the writer's block. It's called The Dangerous Bride. It was a book that described a very anxious time in my life. It was, it's a book about my um, failures at being non-monogamous. It's about how twice I tried to have non-monogamous relationships and failed gloriously. <laughs> <laughs> and I really wanted the readers to feel what it, what it was like to be me in, at those times, in those years. And so to, to, to sort of uh, explain the emotional truth, to make it palpable on the page, I uh, kind of played with my own personality, with how I portrayed myself on the page. And I emphasized, overemphasized uh, the more neurotic aspects of my personality. There are plenty of them, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and I've, I've overemphasized the fact that my hair is often messy because that became a metaphor to the emotional mess as well in the book. Whereas in reality, it's true that my hair is often messy, but sometimes it's not. In reality, <laughs> I can be very neurotic, but I can also be very organized and confident in some other areas. But to tell the emotional truth of those years, I had to do all these things. And to summarize this up, this was just an example, but I mean, there's so many different ways to do this, but I also believe that um, it's okay for me as a memoirist to, to play like this with facts or with self-representation, as long as I make a contract with my readers. So I always have uh, at the start of my memoirs um, kind of a little author's note, which I really love. It's my best friend, <laughs> where I declare up front. I say things like, for the sake of the narrative drama, I condense some events, etc., etc. Perfect. Get out of jail, freak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's funny, interesting you say that because I just got an email uh, it was yesterday, day before yesterday, and it was from, from a. Um, um, uh, a bloke who'd um, done my Paris workshop. Mm -hmm. He was actually had been a, um, a federal member of parliament in, in Victoria, in fact, um, the, the guy. And, he, you know, he was a sensible kind of person. Um, and um, <laughs> and um, he, but he wrote to me because he'd just read True Friends. Um, and he said that he was very surprised by, by the narrator that didn't, didn't, uh, didn't sound like the, um, you know, the confident, um, competent woman that he, that he knew in Paris. And, <laughs> and I thought it's exactly, you know, I'm, there is, it, it, is, it is me, but it's, it's, it's an aspect of me and it's a, a narrating self. You know, there's, mm -hmm. a, and I think that's, that's who writes who writes memoir, it's, 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 it's a narrating self, which is a particular storytelling self who notices certain things and is aware of certain things and is um, not necessarily the person who sits down to, to teach a writing class. Mm. Which makes me think about how I just, just before this uh, session, actually, I met your husband for the first time, yeah. and I said to him spontaneously, oh, I think I know you, because I read about him in Patty's book. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. of course, it's going to be just a, as you said, a, little a construct version. and a particular version. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. And how do you both manage that, you know, people approaching you with this sense of intimacy and this sense of knowing the real you when... That's not necessarily, we've just talked about the case. Well, they do, they do know you, 
really, in a, in a, in a way, but um, you don't know them. Mm. <laughs> and that's what's a little bit disconcerting, you know, mm. because they know all sorts of things about your relationships and, and your um, mm. inclinations and maybe even your sex life, but you don't know <laughs> anything about them. So they've got every advantage over <laughs> you. <laughs> that's interesting. I, I, what I find disconcerting about this most is actually it's a different thing. I always feel like when I meet people who read my memoirs, I have to perform to a certain standard. Mm -hmm. and, that's <laughs> <laughs> and, it's not that, and it's not like I show myself to be perfect in my memoirs, the very opposite. Well, most of my memoirs are about my baby, bad behavior, but <laughs> bad choices I made. <laughs> but it's more about what I feel that when I write, and I think one of the reasons why I write is um, I always try, I write because I think I'm a better person in writing. <laughs> I'm funnier. I am uh, more articulate, I'm more thoughtful, you know, I had time to think what I want to say. So when I meet readers, I feel a bit worried. Yeah, <laughs> bit yeah real no, I, I relate to that totally, yes, <laughs> what she said. <laughs> it's wild that they let us come out and do public speaking, really. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Should be hiding. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so you're both prolific and acclaimed authors of fiction and non-fiction, and I was wondering if you could sort of talk us through how you see those two genres sitting alongside each other? Mm. Well, I've only written one novel, mm -hmm. um, and that was a while ago now, and it actually was about a woman who was writing a life story <laughs> 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 of, of her son. Her son had gone missing in Asia. He'd gone travelling, and it was before emails and uh, you know, texts and things like that, and mm. he did hadn't he hadn't returned. So it was about her searching for him, um, and uh, and she wrote the story of his life to try and make him magic him back to life by mm. writing the story of him. But um, I do, I mean, I for me, um, both fiction and nonfiction are are uh, creating a, a kind of uh, reality um, on the page mm. um, that other people can inhabit, you know, that other people can, can move into. And, and to me, it, it requires all the same capacities of creating in words a, the illusion of a sort of 3D reality on the page. Um, and it gives the, to me, it gives the same... Um, rewards to the reader as well. Mm. You know, it's, it's, uh, they're just, um, I mean, they're, they're so closely related. I was saying to my students this morning that people often think, particularly memoir is more aligned to, to history mm. um, or to navel gazing, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but I, I don't see it like that. I mean, I see memoir and um, fiction as, as very closely related. Biography is more related to history, mm. but I think memoir and fiction are both um, ways of kind of uh, creating a reality on the page um, made of words. Mm. So it's, it's, it, it's this, to me, they're, they're very similar. And I think there's also a borderland with, um, with um, memoir in that we do kind of maybe move things around and um, re kind of uh, exaggerate certain things or pull other things back, mm. you know. And I notice, you know, with, with say with, with someone someone like Helen Garner, um, you know, with with the first stone, there was a lot of attack there, and they're saying that she amalgamated people and all that kind of thing. That that was called uh, that was nonfiction. So then she wrote the, the Quiet Room. Is it the Quiet and Room? And the yeah, spare room. Spare yeah. room. Yeah. Spare room. She called that a novel. And then she got attacked for calling it a novel when everyone could see that it was about the friend of her. So I think mm. you can't win. Call it a memoir, call it a novel. Mm. You know, someone's going to um, get upset with you. Um, so I, I, I mean, the, the territory that I inhabit is a kind of a, a hybrid, a borderland kind of territory. But I, I think it's, it's um, uh, a close relation of fiction and... and um, it's it's a very it's a very um, blurry mm. area, I think. Mm. I I really relate to what Patty is saying about how memoir and fiction are not actually, um, you know, kind of se very separate entities. Because I think well written memoir and well written novel give you the same um, benefit, the same the same experience, really, as you say 
of understanding in depth what it's like to be another person. So I don't see it navel gazing uh, if, if sort of you explore your own experience. I don't see the difference basically, the ethical difference between exploring deeply your own experiences or experiences of character you imagine and which is actually likely to have some of your traits, even if it sounds, seems like it, the, the protagonist doesn't because it comes from us still. It's really all about delving very uh, deeply into, well, it's well written again, into very deeply into psychology of, of human beings. But I think um, um, they do have for me as a writer their own sort of distinct pleasures and perils, and that's why I keep moving between different genres. I started as a fiction writer, I wrote three books of fiction, short stories and novels. Then I moved into memoirs and hybrid memoirs, so creative non-fiction, and now I'm again starting to write, going back to fiction and starting to write a novel. And it's because when I write memoir, I, um, for me, the, the benefits of memoir, the main sort of joys of memoir is, um, memoir is a very flexible form. Novel can also be very flexible form. You can bring essayistic aspects into it and, uh, and other aspects, but not as easily as into memoir. Whereas memoir to me is a bit like a cookie dough. And you can sort of mix all sorts of ingredients into it. A muffin dough. I'm not a good baker, so <laughs> just don't give me the analogy. But you can you can really mix anything you want into it. You can mix poetry, photography, snippets of diaries, uh, mm. re serious research, interviews, whatever. At least I do it. I mix everything. So when I want to explore to a topic really from all different sides, this is where I'll go. Um, but sometimes I don't want to explore anything. Sometimes I want to, to live a dream and be sort of really inhabited by a dream. And this is when I'll go to fiction. It doesn't mean I won't be doing research, but it's, the research will become not the driver, but something I'll do later perhaps. But, but if first of all, it's to live the dream. It's when I really want to sort of not to be accountable for anything for a while, mm. <laughs> then I'll go mm. into fiction. Mm. Mm. And um, <clears throat> you both touch on this in your books, but um, Patty, you talk a lot about um, the fallibility of memory, and True Friends actually opens with this, it's like a little fragment um, where you're presumably telling this friend that you've written a book about her and your friendship, and her response is, that's not me, that's only your construction of me, whatever <laughs> you have written of me is not me. And Lee, um, you talk about it too, but what really stayed with me was the person that shared a name and the heritage <laughs> of someone very passingly mentioned in one of your books, and they felt compelled to email you to clarify that it was not them. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not them. <laughs> and um, I think, you know, having very, very briefly um, taught nonfiction at uni and, and hearing people that talk, that teach it more intensely than me, you know, something that comes up a lot is people being worried about hurting the people in their life, hurting the people that they're writing about and, um, or having other responses that they might not anticipate. And I was wondering how you both um, conceptualise that and deal with that in your own work and how you support your students when they're writing theirs. Okay, this is a very fraught topic. Yeah. Um, and uh, that, that quote that you read from the beginning, um, um, that, that's actually an example of a slight um, change in um, the kind of the, the detail about it, in, in that it was, uh, it was my partner who I asked, um, <laughs> you know, uh, do you mind? I wasn't going to change anything or take him out. I was just wanting to know if he minded. Um, and, <laughs> and, uh, and he said, um, you know, that's not me. That's just mm -hmm. your construction of me. And I said, and you understanding that is why I love you, because mm -hmm. he understands that it is a construction, you know. But when I had that quote at the beginning of the book in, in the draft form, it made it sound like um, it was going to be a book about him. Mm. And that would have headed the reader off in an entirely different direction. So mm. I changed it to she rather than he because my partner's male. So I changed it to, um, to, to she. Um, so that is even a kind of slight dodge. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, the point is that I was uh, – obviously the point I was trying to make is, is that um, all a, um, a writer does is um, 
put that stuff on the page that everyone has in their heads because mm -hmm. everyone has a version of everybody else that they know. Everyone who knows you has got a construction inside their head of, of Eliza and, and, and of you and of all of us. And everyone walking around has a construction, mm -hmm. who knows me has got a construction. They're all, all a bit different. But all a writer does is actually put that a memoir writer, is put that on, on the page. We've all got it. We're all carrying it around in our heads and put it on mm. the page. But, but um, people generally, um, surprisingly, don't like being watched. And, <laughs> and they are. We all are all the time. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it's disconcerting. Um, but when, when I'm writing, I mean, it, to me, for myself and for other people, I, I say, like, look at your motivation, really. Mm. Um, not your literary motivation, but your, your kind of, uh, your other, like, ethical or moral, and it is, you know, what are your motives? Are you trying to um, kind of explore um, a particular idea or relationship or a concept or uh, tell a story, or um, are you actually out for revenge, you mm. know, um, um, or... Um, you know, hurting someone or embarrassing someone or, or whatever. So, um, to me, um, if you were limited by the fact that it might hurt somebody, then there would be very, very little, like most of literature would disappear. There'd be mm -hmm. very little that you could write. So, I, I mean, I sometimes use um, what I call the, the surgeon's defence, is that, you know, like, you, in the surgeon has the knife and he or she knows it's going to hurt you, but if he didn't or she didn't do the operation because it would hurt you, then um, there would be no possibility of mm. saving your life or changing your life or anything like that. And I think, in, in a sense, um, you know, a writer does know at times that it will hurt somebody. Mm. They are, and I ask people to think about that. Will it hurt? And, and, and if you know it will hurt, um, that's not necessarily a reason not to write it because it might be necessary for you um, to do that. But you've got to look at the necessity, you know. Are, are you exposing the affair that your father had with the woman next door um, to hurt him or to hurt your mother? Or are you wanting to look at a family dynamic of secrecy or, or something like that? I think it's very difficult. I mean, I speak very personally from this because it's been extremely traumatic for me, a uh, reaction to, to my book, mm -hmm. um, to this particular mm -hmm. book. And there has been other reactions to earlier books as well. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a theoretical question yeah. <laughs> that you're asking me here. It's, mm -hmm. it's something that I've found quite traumatising. But having been through all of that, I would still write what I wrote because I think that... Um, as, as a writer, I needed to be able to explore those particular issues. Um, and that can seem to others a bit ruthless. Mm. You know? I don't feel ruthless, but <laughs> I can see that that's how it can be judged. Mm. That's so fascinating and um, reminds me of, I think you talk about writers having ice in their heart. I wish it was me, it was Graham Greene. <laughs> a writer has to have a shadow of ice in their heart, mm. yeah. Who, who said it? Uh, Graham Greene. Oh, right. yeah. yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. it's a really great quote. Um, I really applaud you, Patty, for, for still keep, keep writing. I know it is quite traumatising, isn't it? I've, I've had those experiences too. And actually, going just before I answer this question, but to me this is part of actually talking about the divide between fiction and memoir. And I think... Uh, even though I, I'm going to contradict myself slightly, <laughs> even, though, <laughs> even though I said before that uh, fiction and memoir are very, very close, but I also think memories do put themselves on the line much more than fiction writers in some ways. Um, and, and that's why actually I really love the genre of memoir, because when writers put themselves on the line, um, it feels to me like there's something urgent about the book, the urgency, the stakes are rise, rising, and for me then I enjoy more the work as well. Um, I um, also, I mean, I really agree with what you say about uh, how if we don't, if we write books where we, where we don't hurt anybody, you can't really make a proper literature. Um, I, I really think that the marriage between being a writer, a good writer, and being a decent person is not an easy one. <laughs> so, <laughs> mm, mm, mm. And, and uh, uh, really, I mean, we always do make this, we always do have to make these choices. Uh, and I'm thinking about 
my, one of my favorite living writers, uh, if not their favorite, no, not their favorite, but one of the favorites, so I'm arguing with myself here and on the page, but <laughs> then if you haven't read the Norwegian author Karl of Knoz, I was just about to know? mention him, yeah. yes, yes. How amazing, he, he's amazing. Yeah. He's just, uh, I, I just, I'm really a huge fan of his. And he writes in his memoirs, he really tells it all. I mean, I don't know him personally, maybe it's just the illusion he creates, but it seems as if he does. He even tells things that other people don't know he knows and don't want him to say, like his late mother's uh, alcoholism. So I wouldn't want to be related to him. <laughs> so no. no, you, <laughs> but, no. but when I do want to, to sort of um, understand what human condition is like, how conflicted we are inside, how, to what extremes we can go, I would go and I read his books. Because he is actually not an extreme person in his own life, but, but he shows us how the internal dramas, how she experienced they can be. And before I was a full-time writer, I used to be a therapist, and uh, I found out that whoever sits with you in the room, if the most sort of average-looking kind of nice person, <laughs> once they feel safe, the things they have to tell you, they're pretty... Uh, extreme and, and, and big and amazing and scary. But anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, yeah, I'm going on another track. But basically, um, yeah, I just think um, you don't have to be Knoz God to be a good memoir writer, but there is a sort of a continue, ethical continuum of the choices you make. How you, that's what I said to students, uh, how, how you going to, how much you, you'll tell about other people. And, um, you know, so on one sort of extreme end of this continuum would be Knoz God. And on the other will be like these toothless kind of books which usually don't get published where, you know, they don't hurt anybody. They don't offend anybody, but nobody wants to read yeah. them. Yeah. <laughs> so Just don't you, marry Nilfgaard, that's all. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's exactly right. Yes, yes. So, so I really, you need, I think, so I always say to my students, just think where you want to sit on this continuum, closer to Knozgaard in the middle. And for me, one of my ground rules that I stole from Helen Garda, Ghana mm. <laughs> is um, she talks about how if, you're being, if you are hard on yourself, then... She feels, if she's hard on herself as a character, she feels more allowance yes. to be like this if other people. But just one more quick thing I'll say yeah. about this is that my other grand rule to myself is that I, I always think I'll tell my story as much as it's related to these people, to the people in my life, but I won't tell their secrets. So, for example, when I was writing The Dangerous Bride, uh, my second husband, who I was describing, there were quite, some details about him that uh, if I put into the book, they would have been very vivid, would be really great for his characterization, very amusing to the readers, very, very uncomfortable for him. These particular details did not bear direct relevance to our story of our marriage, so I omitted them. Yes, no, I, I, I think that's interesting. I mean, and I, I think, you know, I, I have um, broken that rule to some extent in this book, in, in the writing conversations, um, of, of a friendship, particular friendship, which um, uh, are not, uh, don't put the person in a bad light, but they still consider them to be um, private. But the other thing that I would add to, to what you said, um, and I think that's really important um, to ask yourself, does the book need it? Mm. But the other thing I think is that in writing about those things that are usually um, secret or hidden, are uh, very liberating for the reader. You know, and, and I think that it's like so many people have spoken to me since this book has come out about the kind of pain and confusion and difficulty of friendship breakups. And before that, there was actually no... I mean, it gives permission. It gives permission to people. If you write about secret things or hard things, it makes people feel like, ah, I am part of the human race. I haven't mm. just suffered this thing on my own. So I think... Um, keeping anything secret or hidden um, makes it more damaging, I think. So I mm. think, in a, in a sense, you have to have the courage to put those secret and maybe uh, what other people consider um, private. Mm. Um, but at the same time, I, I totally get that people might not want to have any more conversations with me ever again. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's what I said to my second husband because he was really against me writing this book and he never read it as a, in a protest. But uh, I did say it to him, I was writing it. And I said to him, look, you know, you, you knew you were marrying a writer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. And Lee, you sort of, you talk about, it's, you've coined this amazing term, um, non-esty, <laughs> sort of encapsulates work that doesn't have that truth and resonance to it. And I was wondering 
how do you identify whether your work is going to where it needs to be, whether it's got that truth and resonance to it, or whether it is sort of falling back onto honesty. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, no, <laughs> the word honesty, it was actually sort of, uh, I just kind of made it up for me when I was blocked in those four years. I, because I was, I, it's, my writer's block was not like a, you know, like a plumbing blockage that you just can't write. I was writing all the time, but not good. I was, um, what I was, I tried to sort of explain to myself what I was doing wrong, and this is how I came up with the word honesty. And what I mean by this is that I wasn't writing lies, but I was uh, photoshopping reality. Mm -hmm. I was making mm -hmm. it simpler and, and nicer. So, for With example, the gloss, yeah. what's that? putting a gloss on it. Yeah, exactly. Putting a gloss, but also sort of, you know, smoothing the corners, sort of yes, making yes. it round and no wrinkles and no yeah, that yeah. sort of yes. kind of thing. Uh, yes. So, for example, if my character was feeling um, a particular emotion, I would write, she was sad, but what does it actually mean? You can be sad in a very pleasurable kind of way when you're watching a, some old movie and you're kind of crying, having a cry, and it's a nice kind of sadness. Or you can be deeply grieving over somebody close to you who just died. What does it actually mean when the character is sad? But, uh, so instead of sort of exploring those things, I would just um, kind of airbrush it and just put this word sad or... Uh, if there was any any sort of difficult subjects, um, uh, uh, you know, to write about, I would sort of try and avoid the difficulties, and that's what I mean by honesty. And how do I feel when I when I write with honesty? Um, I think I uh, I feel with thoroughly. I actually listen to my body, even in those four years when I was blocked, I could identify that I was writing rubbish, and that's why I was. <laughs> <laughs> mm, mm, mm. And that's why it was so hard because I knew I was doing the wrong thing. Mm, mm. <laughs> I just didn't know how to get out of the wrong thing. Yes, yes. So it's still now when I sort of once I've written a draft and when I read it, I know this this feeling. It's like in my gut where I, yeah. I know this is bad. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. I, I feel it as a kind. Of a, a coating of gunk. That's how wow. I. That's Ooh. how I feel. Yes, that's it's beautiful. horrible. Yeah, no, <laughs> it's horrible. Yeah, yeah. I, and I and I think um, for me, uh, you know, the the breakthrough actually happened. And, and this is the use of writers' festivals. It was actually <laughs> years ago, the Byron Bay Writers' Festival, and um, it was the first time I was a guest at a writers' festival. And I was feeling very self-conscious, and I didn't know how to look and be as a writer. And I I kept running back and changing my clothes. <laughs> <laughs> where I was saying, but anyway, um, Helen Garner read out two stories from I think it was from one of her collections, and one was about a baby, a child being killed by the stepfather, mm -hmm. and it was just terrible. And I remember feeling this kind of rage, even at Helen Garner for reading it out. I thought this is too <laughs> awful, this is too terrible. And then she read a story about a baby being born in Penrith Hospital. And it was all about life renewing itself. And I felt I'd been through catharsis. I felt completely kind of cleansed and, and, and purified. And, and, um, and I realised then and there, in that moment, that that's what I needed, that, that Helen Gunner didn't shy away from any truth, however harsh or however beautiful it was. She's, she looked clearly and simply at, at that. And um, I decided in that moment that that's what I needed to do. And um, I, I think that was the turning point for me. I actually wrote her a, um, a letter about it afterwards and we'd bump into each other sometimes. And she sent me one of her postcards, which said, you know, that, um, that I had, um, because I talked about how you just need to um, write what it is that you see um, step by step mm. by step. And, and that makes it sound really very simple, but to get to that kind of clarity can be very difficult, I think. Mm -hmm. and, and I think each time I remember, okay, what is it that I am seeing? What mm -hmm. is it that I'm seeing here and now? And trying to get that on the page. Mm -hmm. I think we should rename this panel uh, uh, Helen Garner Admiration Society. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yes, 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 yes. Look yes. at T-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 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 yes. And... Do you uh, feel as though drafting moves you towards truth or away from truth in your work? Oh, that's a good question. Very good. I think it can do both, but I, I think that most it would be moving me towards mm. truth. 
um, because I have done a, a kind of blurring, I haven't been precise, I haven't actually seen what it was that I saw. I, I have just done the kind of um, blur about something without going in really close and seeing what it is. So I think in, in drafting, I probably do get um, more truthful about what it is that I noticed um, and, and uh, being more precise. But I think every now and then, and this is probably just sometimes cutting something because... Um, maybe because of fear. I try not to let fear make any of my decisions. I think it's, it's I don't think fear makes good decisions, except if you're on the edge of a cliff or something like yeah. that. You know, <laughs> step back a bit, you know. <laughs> but generally speaking in writing, I don't think fear makes good uh, decisions. But I think maybe every now and then I have. Um, and, you know, with writing this, I would sometimes be consumed with fear. Mm. Um, most days, in fact. <laughs> but um, I decided, you know, that I wasn't going to let fear make decisions so that when I was um, redrafting, I would only try to get more clear rather mm. than rather than dodge something. Yeah. Yeah, same for me, really. Always, always towards the truth because my first drafts are just, uh, you know, just visceral on the page, which is, there's some truth in it, but then you have to make sense of this truth. And uh, I... Eliza and I were just talking about this before the, the event when I'm one of the writers, and I think you maybe as well, that I, I only understand what I think about something when I've written it, mm. but I then need to rewrite and rewrite, and I think about my revision process, my drafting and redrafting process. I call it, for myself, again, to calm myself down, I call it layering, so I see it as layers. So I first try this sort of mess, and then, every, every, and then I start layering it with meaning and understanding what is it actually what I'm trying to say here and, and why. Mm -hmm. that's, um, that's very, very interesting. And uh, Lee and I both write fairly similarly, which is just chaos, basically. <laughs> mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. And um, what I wanted to ask both of you is, Lee, you include a quote from Thomas, Ma Thomas Mann uh, that I'm about to butcher, but basically that <laughs> writing, is, writing is something that's harder for writers than other people. Do you want me to say it? Yes, please. <laughs> Writers are those people who find writing difficult. <laughs> yes, yes. Counterintuitive, but so true, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Sorry. Um, <laughs> and I was wondering, you know, when you're working on something, how do you know when to persevere and when to step away and just move on from a piece of work? When, it, when it's really not working and I should shelve it? Um, I usually, I usually I know pretty soon if what I'm doing is doesn't have this sort of. It's like with honesty, you know. It's the same thing. I, I usually I just know. But then when I was blocked on those four years, sorry, I keep sort of going back to that experience. But it was a really formative experience for me as a writer. Um, um, also because it happened while I was tra transitioning from writing in Hebrew to writing in English because I moved to Australia and I just realized it's hard to be a writer in English when I, eh, sorry, in Hebrew when I don't live in Israel anymore. Um, so, um, so how do I know when, so in those four, four years, uh, I actually lost that ability which I think writers really need to have and to develop really. It's not like we have it, we develop it, but uh, I, I, I lost that ability to also evaluate my material. So. I would write, because sometimes in those four years I've written material that actually was not that bad as I thought it was, and later I used it in some other works I published, but um, I just didn't know what I was doing, <laughs> basically. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I think if, if I'm, now I think if I sort of step away from those works and just left them alone for about maybe a few months or even a year and came back, maybe that would have helped to know mm -hmm. as well. But normally, yeah, normally I do know when I'm writing what I need to be writing or not. <laughs> Mm. About you, Patty? Um, well, I think that um, usually I would probably show it. To, I, I do show it to somebody else, you know, to to a reader, um, at and usually around um, you know thirty thousand words or so, because um, um, I don't know whether it's it's working or not. I I can change from day to day, thinking one day it's brilliant and the next day it's it's terrible. And so I give it to someone who's an experienced um, re uh, writer and reader, mm. of course, to, um, to kind of give me an idea of um, 
basically, no, it's not editing or anything, it's just, is this working? Mm. Is, this, is this doing something or not? Um, and I can usually, and that usually gives me a break, as you were saying, you know, um, a bit of time off from it. And then when I look at it again, I can tell um, whether it's doing something or not, you know. And, and I, I mean, I'm a very persistent person, you know. <laughs> I, I will stick at things, you know, and I'll keep going with things. And, and even when something doesn't seem to be working, um, I still kind of have an idea that maybe I can find a way for it to work, mm. you know. And so I do um, kind of try different things. And I will listen, not always, but I will listen to what other people say <laughs> um, to me ab about things, you know, like with the, say, with um, The Joy of High Places, which was my story about long distance walking. I walked for hundreds of kilometres, but also about my brother who fell out of the sky and broke his spine in four places when he was hang gliding. Mm. It's about him learning to walk again. So I had his, my long slow walking and his super dramatic kind of spine breaking um, struggle. Um, was he even going to live? Um, would he never walk again? That kind of thing. Mm. So it was very hard to get them both to, to work together. And I thought um, for a long time, that m maybe they, they were two different books. And sometimes, you know, one of my readers said, are you sure this is not two different books? And I think, no, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Even though I thought that myself. But, but I, did, um, I, 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 I did want them to, to work together. Um, and so basically, um, someone said to me, um, I think you need to go chop, 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 chop <laughs> with a knife, you know, um, and kind of break them up into two different stories more because I had long chunks of his because his was so much more dramatic than mine. I thought no one would want to hear about my long, slow walking. Um, but she said, no, it's the opposite, you know. Um, chopping it up would let us kind of go backwards and forwards between between the two. So I think it, it's, it's a kind of combination of... Um, uh, my determination to make it bloody well work and <laughs> listening um, to other people and having a bit of time away from it. I mean, there has been times when I've given up altogether. I mean, there's, there's, there's a couple of manuscripts, you know, that, that haven't gone anywhere, but they might one day. Who knows? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I guess it's just such a learnt process, isn't it, working, mm -hmm. working mm -hmm. out when to persevere. I have one final question before I will be inviting you both to read from your wonderful books. And that question is, I think, when we think about life writing and creative nonfiction, it's often in the context of human and doing justice to people. And I was wondering if you could both talk to us about being truthful to environment and being truthful to nature and surroundings. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I, I have I have written in um, the Joy of High Places is a lot of nature writing in mm. that my observations of um, the world around me, and because most of the long walking that I do, um, only because there's sort of accommodation along the way, I guess, is in Europe. So it's not a landscape that I am familiar with. And then there's also the issue of the names of things. Mm. I didn't know and don't know the names of most things that I'm looking at, you know. So I, um, I had to uh, sort of take notes and take photographs and do research to find out what the names of, names of things were. And uh, then there's also the added issue of romanticising. Mm when it's a different kind of place, you know, and, and being kind of yeah, romanticising the, the whole thing. So I think it can be just as difficult to be truthful, or maybe not just as difficult, because the tree's not going to turn around and smack you or... or, <laughs> or, in, or I can get angry me more. <laughs> or, yes, or engage a lawyer to, to sue you or, or something like that. Um, and... I, I think, it, but I do think it's difficult, and I think um, Ro uh, Robert McFarlane, the English um, writer who whom I adore, mm -hmm. um, s said, you know, that that it it can be um, that kind of romanticised um, kind of writing about landscape can be, it can be very um, kind of controlling, mm -hmm. and can be about possession, and and also can be about nationalism, 
and all those sorts of things. Mm. So I, th I think, you know, it's, it's very important to, to look at what you're doing when you are um, writing about the landscape and writing about the world around you. And, and are you, I mean, my, my kind, of, kind of underlying idea is to try to always um, have a real relationship with what is, you mm. know, and which is um, the opposite of romanticism. And um, that's always been a kind of life, a lifelong battle for me because I was kind of grew up on kind of a, a romantic 19th century writers like um, Ethel Turner and Ellen Montgomery, mm. who um, who I who shaped my whole life really, you know, in, in terms of being, you know, because they always wrote about girls who wanted to be creative, mm. you know. But there is a kind of romanticism in that as well, and I think romanticism is part of the gunk. Actually, <laughs> the gun. You know, yes, you know, and so it's try in, in in writing about the world around you. It's to, to try to yeah to try to have a real relationship with what mm. is. So fascinating. Thank you. <laughs> um, I find also uh, this idea of romanticizing or not romanticizing your uh, environment fascinating. I've never thought about it like this, mm. but and now I'll be thinking about it <laughs> thanks to you. <laughs> um, I read The Joy of High Places and love this book and. Um, Patty really that is wonderful in recreating, and now I know also not romanticizing yeah. <laughs> landscape. Well, maybe I did. <laughs> no. yeah. uh, not not to what I my understanding, but then I need to reread it now. Um, um, I'm actually Eliza, a very. Um, I'm a very urban creature. <laughs> <laughs> my idea of nature is a park where I take my children to. But, <laughs> mm. but uh, if I can sort of answer this question with a little twist, and uh, because I'm a writer who changed countries so much, I mean, I, I lived in Russia, I lived in Ukraine, I lived in Israel, I'm living in Australia, and even here I did live, moved between different states. Um, I've always um, places a really huge thing in my work and the countries mm. and particularly cities because I develop really passionate relationships with uh, cities and when I say passionate it can be love hate uh, feeling too um, so I've always uh, really interested in, um, in in writing places and for me the truth of writing about uh, these sort of places like countries and cities is I, I really feel that cities, different cities have different personalities. Mm -hmm. um, I think I've probably properly lived in at least 10 cities in my life, like for long periods, like being really settled there. And um, a, when I write about those cities, I'm always really interested to try and articulate what are the particularities, what are the singularities of the place. Mm. And, and I know, as you say, Patty, with its construction as well, it's how they appear to me. But I also believe that writers, when we write places of people, as much as there are constructions, when we're good writers, um, I think we, uh, as Patty definitely is, <laughs> I think we just, we do probably capture the essence of things as well, even though, at least to me, when I read um, works of writers, I do feel that they capture for me some essence of places and people as well. And so, um, that, that's for me the, probably the truth. So when I write about Tel Aviv or when I write about uh, Kemero, which a little, mining town nobody heard about in Siberia until there was a big explosion there. Mm. <laughs> but uh, So when I write about those places, I really think about them like people I have relationships with. Mm. Mm. Yes. That complex interplay between people and place, which you capture so beautifully in all of the works of yours that I've read. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so we have five minutes left. <laughs> so. Um, I think we, we go with readings. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. It's just one page. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. I can read fast. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is from near the beginning of um, True Friends and um, the character um, Gina, who's the central story of the um, friendship breakup, but this is near the beginning. <clears throat> After the Balmain Cafe meeting with Gina, I had not felt tested but exposed. I had undressed in public, as I do when I write. She had seen my blotchy, naked mind and heart, or rather, she had already seen it in my book, and there I was in real life, still unclothed. A total stranger had seen the messy insides of my gut, the green shadows in my brain. When I meet a reader in life, I usually feel an uncomfortable three-part split into the storyteller who's done the writing, the self I have constructed on the page, 
and the ordinary woman who is standing there in front of them awkwardly in pieces. I shuffle a bit, I try to hold eye contact, I try to speak as if conversation comes naturally. But with Gina, it was different. In that first meeting, I was not divided. Everything in me was subsumed into the storyteller. The storyteller was the only one who breathed, the only one who spoke, and the relief of being whole was like a drug rush, warm and flowing and opening my heart. In that whole state, I glowed, knowing without question that Gina saw my best self. I spoke every sentence with passion and clarity and even humility. I was a vessel. But afterwards, as I waited for her to arrive in Paris, I was afraid again. What if that was a one-off? What if I would be split as usual when we met again? She would see the clunky country girl, the awkward shuffling woman instead of the glowing one. She would wonder what the hell was going on. I sat in my fifth floor eerie in the Rue Simard and worried. I put it aside. I wrote. I shopped at markets. I practiced French. I sang in a choir. I worried. But I need not have. Gina's delight in being in Paris swept all before it in a warm, dissolving wave. A decade or so earlier, she'd lived there for a year herself, studying physical performance at an acting school in the Rue du Faubourg Saint-Denis. So that coming back was a return to the centre of her practice and her passion as an actor. She was as thrilled as I was to be in this mythical place, which mostly existed inside her own heads. We shared... Friends share a construction, a common interpretation of the world, a common gaze. Mm, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to read um, from an introduction to the first part of the book, which discusses um, emotional honesty in the process of writing itself. <laughs> Just one page, of course, too. Once upon a time, I killed a novel it was a sexy, slinky, burning tale, in my mind, that is. Mm -hmm. It was a love story between a troubled man and a woman who was placed at his mercy by unfortunate circumstances, in theory. In reality, I was so afraid to fail that I overstuffed the novel with secondary characters, subplots, and themes until I had no energy left for my protagonists. On the page, they turned up pale and gaunt, one-dimensional. Nothing happened to them as I was preoccupied with realizing the themes and wrangling the stories of minor characters. That was when I was writing. Most of the time, I spent not writing, but researching, and subsequently felt that to justify all the hard work, I ought to put everything I had learned into the book. <laughs> that task, too, proved to be so weighty that when I wasn't researching, I was planning the book to cope with the overload. <laughs> <laughs> the problem was writing pre-planned chapters is as tedious for me as doing my tax return. <laughs> As if all this wasn't lethal enough, I also discussed my novel with anyone who cared to listen. And with every conversation, that mysterious magic I had initially felt about the story leaked away until I forgot why I wanted to write it in the first place. All that happened long ago, during the honesty time, when I was out of touch with how my writing process works, more recently, that novel has resurfaced in my mind while I've been writing other books. I have taken a great deal of notes for it and wrote a new synopsis, altering the plot significantly and calling the secondary characters. The names of protagonists are now different, and so is the main ethnicity. And yet, the novel's weather is the same, the claustrophobia of that relationship, the self-destruction, the erotic doom. I often visualize my works as if they are paintings, and the novel's palette is still the same too. The silver and hockey of Australian bush with occasional splashes, splashes of crimson. So I'm going to challenge myself now to be just a tiny bit like Patty. I, I can never mention <laughs> beautiful environmental descriptions, but no, I'll try no, there the we bush. There we have it. <laughs> <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> Uh, so, it turns out I lied about having time for questions, <laughs> but 
Patty and Lee will both be out at the signing table, so if you've got any burning questions for them, you can go and ask them outside. And there's also uh, books for sale that they'll sign beautifully for you. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for coming, and thank you so much, Lee and Patty. It was an absolute joy to talk to you today. Um, and thank you. Oh, thank yes, thank you, you Lisa. <laughs> so um, I'm back here tomorrow for Haunting Stories with Jason Steger talking to me, Jock Sarong, and Nadi Simpson about our novels. And the next event in here is Storytelling the Essentials with Margaret Heakey talking with Michelle de Cresta, Amal Arwood, and screenwriter Keir Wilkins about form, freedom, and constraint in writing for different mediums. So tickets for um, that event and any others you might be interested in are available at the front desk. Um, but yes, thank you again, and hope you all have a absolutely wonderful rest of the Ride Around the Murray Festival. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>